us. So again, in some sense, this is going to be the hardest lecture of the rest of the semester because you've just had a two-week vacation. Hopefully not from calculus. Hopefully you've been working on calculus throughout the whole two weeks on the beaches or wherever you've been traveling. But in this case, that is not necessarily true. It will take a while for things to come back up. It was very important that we finished the differentiation part of the course right before spring break so that we're going on to new material. I think this material is a little bit easier than the differentiation material. One of the ways classes like this work is it takes a while for things to sink in. And so if you haven't done as well in the first diagnostic or the first exam that really counted as you would have liked, they don't have to count. There's plenty of time for the material to come in. Okay? So talk to me, talk to the TAs, talk to the math science resource people. I'm actually having a meeting with the TAs at lunch today to talk about things to do to help you with some of the problems on the exam where you have to look at things a little bit differently than you've seen in class. And so I'm going to try to come up with some supplemental mathematics for you to do that actually has good, interesting applications. Oh, I'm being recorded? Uh, oh, yeah. Sorry. Okay, that's fine. No, that's fine. I just have to let me careful what I say. <laughs> um, and so I will talk to you know, the TAs and I will arrange for you, I think, to look at some interesting modules that I've been working on with some colleagues for high school students. And again, it's not because I think you can't do college-level mathematics. These modules are designed to try to interest high school students into what you can do with mathematics and to think about things computationally. So the hardest part of problem number five on the exam was this was something you hadn't seen before. How do you take something you haven't seen and isolate it? As another exercise, I will give you a song to diagram. How many of you have ever heard the song, I'm My Own Grandpa? <laughs> Futurama fan? Okay, great song, and so I will send you a link to I'm My Own Grandpa. If there was more time in the semester, I would actually play it in class. Maybe we'll play it in class uh, before class starts to, on Wednesday. I'll play the song I'm My Own Grandpa. Try to diagram the song and figure out how this person became his own grandfather without any incest or anything else that was inappropriate. Okay, it is a completely appropriate song. Who are my Futurama fans? It leads to the continued existence of humanity. A very important song. Okay, so I want to try to do a few more things like this to help you get a sense of how to attack some of the problems. We are at the point of the semester now where we can coast a little bit. We're not going to be as pressed for time as we were in the beginning of the semester. That's the advantage of doing things the way we were. I know some of your other classes, oh, I won't, we're being recorded, so I'll leave it at that. Okay, <laughs> and so if some of your other classes may have workloads increasing, the workload here should not be as bad for the rest of the semester. Okay, keep watching the videos, keep reading the notes ahead of time. So what we're going to do now is talk a little bit about integration in several variables. Integration in several variables. How many of you have ever done things in bases other than base 10? Like in high school you might have had you do something in base 8 or base 2. And so instead of writing things with decimals with 0 through 9, you can do zeros and 1s or whatever. Any Tom Lear fans? So there's a beautiful song in Tom Lee, The New Math, where they have to do a problem in base 8. And they say base 8 is just like base 10 if you're missing two fingers. All right? It doesn't really matter what base you use, but you have familiarity with some bases. One of the things we've seen is whenever we get something new, go back to something we've done in Calc 1 or Calc 2. We want to do integration in several variables. If life was really simple, the way you would do integration in several variables is just integrate in one variable twice. Or if you had to do three variables, three times. Okay? In several cases, that's exactly what we're going to do. But not always. And there are some advantages you can use in several variables that you can't quite see in one variable. One of the advantages is we can change coordinates. In one variable, we can, we can change coordinates. And it helps a little bit. It's the use substitution. But fundamentally, we can't really change how a region looks. Oh, it's a line. I change variables. It's another line. I change variables. Oh, it's another line. You really can't change things at all. Let's think about several variables. So, calculus in two variables. What's the nicest shape you can think of? Circle. Okay. The lucky Hamantaschen debate is over. The Hamantaschen <laughs> side won. I can now admit that the circle is a beautiful shape, and I have nothing against it. The circle is wonderful. But from an integration point of view, the circle is a pain. 
What is a beautiful shape for integration? Square. I'm sorry? Square rectangle. Something like squares and rectangles. So the whole idea of the change of variable formula, that's the big thing we're going to lead up to in this unit, is how do we convert circles to squares? This will not help you whenever you have those diagnostic tests of you know, putting the circle peg in the square hole, <laughs> but it will help you with calculation. Okay? How do we do something like this? Well, this is x squared plus y squared is less than equal to 1. This is the equation of the unit circle, the unit disk. Okay? So, and you can write disk in either of the two ways depending on whether or not you're on this side or the other side of the pond. Right? So the British people will put in a C. How can I get from a circle to a square or a rectangle? Polar coordinates. Polar coordinates. So if you use x equals r cosine theta, y equals r sine theta, what do we end up getting? Well, if we put um, theta here and r here, here's r equals 1, here's 2 pi. And the unit circle becomes a rectangle. And that's what we're going to lead up to. This is the difference between several variables and one variable. So to some extent, I taught you, I brought in the clock, I taught you partial differentiation in less than a minute. It was close because I had to write so many things down. But essentially, hold all the variables constant but the variable you care about, and then just pretend it's a Calc 1 problem. So in some sense, if I have to do multiple integrations, I can just pretend I have a sequence of Calc 2 problems. If I have rectangular regions. If I don't have rectangular regions, things are a lot harder. So there are several avenues. One avenue is to basically make your region rectangular. Change coordinates. This is something that's fundamentally different than is in Calc 1. There is another possibility. Okay. So one possibility is to change your region. We talked a little bit about the video of the week is the coin video where I show you the way we do integration in one variable is we just keep walking down the real line and we keep adding it as we go. The other possibility is take all the pennies together, take all the nickels together, take all the dimes together. Instead of changing the region, what could you change? So we're integrating the function over region. If I can't change the region, what could I change? The function. One possibility is you can try to do things, extend the function to be zero outside the region. Now your function may no longer be continuous. That could be a problem for you. These are the two options we have. Okay? So this is the philosophical stuff. This is the big picture of what we're going to lead up to. Okay? All right. So let's talk about how we get there. So I am not going to go through the proof of the fundamental theme of calculus or stuff like that in several variables. I want to just quickly describe what is going on here. So the idea is break into smaller rectangles. So I'm going to assume we start off with a rectangle and I want to find the area of my function on this rectangle. So here's my x-axis, here's my y-axis, and here's some region A. And I want to find the integral over the region A of f of x, y, dA. I'm not going to go through all the details. I'm going to basically just describe how you would do this. One possibility is I could fix a value of y. And then for that fixed value of y, I'm down to a one-dimensional problem. What else could I have done? Fix x. Fix x. Does it matter which order we do things? Sometimes. Sometimes. Sometimes maybe these are safe answers. Okay, you know, think about it at a bank. If you deposit money and then they calculate interest, or they calculate interest and then you deposit money, does it make a difference? Yeah. If you take the exam and then study, or you study and then take the exam, <laughs> does it make a difference? Almost surely, you know, at least if you're studying the right material. <laughs> right? You're probably studying for French is not going to help you too much on these exams. Order matters. For a lot of things, order doesn't matter. If you are taking a French class, I don't think it really matters when you do your French homework versus you know, when you do your math homework. But when we're doing integration, there are times when it matters which order you do things. What does this kind of remind you of? 
from differentiation. Anybody remember? I hate it when order matters. Um, when the function is discontinuous, the order of integration, and if you're integrating... Well, I, I want you differentiation. What or differentiation result do we have? Either way. If, if uh, the function is discontinuous, the order of differentiation matters if you're differentiating in respect, with respect to one good, and then another. Good. So if my function, if my partial derivatives are not necessarily continuous, it could matter the order in which I differentiate. Take the derivative with respect to x and then y is not necessarily the same as the derivative with respect to y and then x. I hate when that happens. I want to not have to worry about which order I'm doing things. And so, if one way is easier, let me start off with the easier way. Let me do the way that will lead to easier algebra. So one of the things we're going to be very concerned with is, when can we switch orders? So what I could do, is I could take a very small strip of length delta y, and I could calculate what's going on in that strip just using calc 1. And then I just take another value of y and I do another strip. And I could have lots of strips like this. Well, how would I calculate what's going on in one of these strips? Well, I break up the x-axis. And so, in fact, what I'm really doing is I'm breaking my region up into lots of little rectangles. And so, we would play the exact same games as before. We would have our upper sums. You know, you use the largest value in each rectangle. You would have the lower sums. And you'd use the smallest value in each rectangle. And you would get the lower is less equal to the integral over a of f x y dA is less equal to the upper. And then you would take a limit, and then in the limit, this would converge to the integral. So take limit, and you squeeze things. Okay? There's a little bit more detail in the video online, but roughly this is what's going on. So you would have all these different convergence questions. Will it converge? Physically, this is what we mean. The way you should think about this is I have some region, and I have a function that tells me how high I am above it. And this is going to calculate the volume underneath the curve, underneath the surface. Just like in one dimension, I'm getting the area under the curve, now I'm getting the volume under the surface. So this is volume under the surface. As before, it's going to be a signed volume. Things below the xy plane will count negative, things above the xy plane will count positive. This in some sense, you should almost think back to the definition of the directional derivative. It's a great definition. It uses calc 1, and you would never, ever, ever want to use that definition in real life. Right? Do you want to chop up regions? Oh, I want right. You should not want to chop up regions into little rectangles, right? There are other ways to vent anger. Okay? <laughs> Do you want to go back in calc 1 and chop up the real line into little itsy bitsy intervals and calculate upper and lower sums? What do you want to use in Calc 1? How do you want to find areas? What do you want to use in Calc 1? So integrate. You want to use the fundamental theorem of calculus. We want to take something like this and say that this double integral, this volume, is equivalent to two one-dimensional integrals. That's how we want to be able to do integrals. If we can do things in two dimensions, can we do things in three dimensions? Yes, we just need more notation. Okay, so I'm not going to go through all the details. You know, this is a first course in Calc 3. I want to give you enough of a sense to understand what's going on. So as I said, there are two ways to do things. What I can do is I can fix a value of y and calculate one of these strips. And then I integrate over all values of y. So I would first x goes from, we'll have this point as the point AC, BC, 
AD, BD. So X goes from A to B of F of XY DX. And that will give me that little strip over there. And now I do this for each value of Y. Y goes from C to D of DY. I've done something here that you normally don't do. What have I done that you normally don't do? Yes? Like the I'm writing the variable X. Okay, it's not because over spring break I actually bought stock in the chalk company that supplies Williams College. I'm trying to make us use extra chalk. Why am I writing this? Because you're fixing, because you're using two different variables. There's two different variables. Let's be really clear what we're doing. We're changing X. Y is fixed. Let's make the notation very clear so I can look down and see what's going on. If I write dx dy, does that mean I integrate with respect to x first and then y? Yes, but does it hurt to just be a little bit more explicit? Okay? So this should equal the integral over a of f of xy dA. But was there any need to hold y fix and then change x? What else could I have done? could have done it the other way. So here's delta x over here. I could have looked at the integral y goes from c to d f of x, y, d, y and then send x from a to b and what should that equal? Should equal the same thing if f and the region are continuous. continuous should be good. So for now, I will use the generic word nice. If everything is nice, this should be true. And then a big theorem in mathematics is, well, what do we mean by nice here? Nice is going to mean uh, if our function is continuous and the region is bounded and simple, everything will be good. Okay? And this is going to be a way to calculate these volumes. These will be called iterated integrals. You can either integrate first with respect to x and then y, or first with respect to y and then x. It doesn't matter. Okay? Any questions about the statement? Any questions about the method as to how we do this? Do you want to do an example now, or do you want to see why this can break down? Example? Let's do an example. Do you want the same example as in the book, or do you want a different example? Different? Okay, let's do a different example. The probability that I will happen to write down the same example is negligible. All right. Let's let f of, f of xy be x cubed y plus e cubed x plus cosine of y. Right, that'll be painful enough to require us to do a few things. And let's say the rectangle is AB cross CD is going to be 0, 1, cross 0, 2 pi. So if you want to draw the rectangle, here's the point 0, 0, here's the point 0, 2 pi. And I want to integrate this. So the integral over the region of f of x, y, dA. I can either integrate with respect to x first or with respect to y first. And I do claim for this problem that one way is a little bit better. Do you want to do the x integral first or the y integral first? Why? Why is correct. Why do you want to do y first? Well, it's actually e cubed. 
So there's really no compli that's just a constant. There's no uh -huh. complications from the E cubed. Why why do we want to do y first? Yes. You can treat the x cubed as a constant. I could have treated the y as a constant. Yes. Yes. Um, is that zero two pi or one two pi? Uh, oh, thank you. Uh, this should be one two pi. Yes. Otherwise, that is a really small region. Thank you. <laughs> What's the integral of cosine of y from zero to two pi? I'm integrating cosine over a complete cycle. What's the integral going to be? Zero. I don't have to worry about, ah, oh, crap, is the integral of cosine sine or negative sine? I'm integrating over a complete cycle. If I integrate it first with respect to x, I actually have something that survives first. It's slightly easier to do the y integration first. Does it really make a difference here? No. So this is the same as the integral. x goes from zero to one, and I like putting in brackets the integral y goes from 0 to 2 pi of x cubed y plus e cubed x plus cosine of y dy dx. Okay? And now we're going to use a lot of the results that you have from calc 1 or calc 2. The integral of a sum is the sum of the integrals. So this is the integral x goes from 0 to 1. The first piece is I'm going to get the integral y goes from 0 to 2 pi of x cubed y dy plus the integral y goes from 0 to 2 pi of e cubed x dy plus the integral from 0 to 2 pi of cosine of y dy dx. So we're using the integral of a sum as the sum of the integrals. I, now what should I do next to evaluate this integral? What rule do I use? So we use the integral of a sum as the sum of the integrals. What's the next rule I can use to try to make things nicer? Constant rule. Constant rule. I can pull out the x cubed. I can pull out the e cubed x here. And so I would get the integral x goes from 0 to 1 of x cubed 0 to 2 pi of y dy plus e cubed x integral y goes from 0 to 2 pi of dy. And what's the integral of cosine of y from 0 to 2 pi? 0. So I'm not going to bother keeping that anymore. Okay. As you become more and more familiar with calc 2 again, you will probably not go through all of these steps. But you know, when it's been a while since you've integrated, it's not bad to just write down everything explicitly. Alright, what's the integral of y dy? It's going to be y squared over 2. So I think I will ask you to move the camera, uh, just so it's not going to get too squished. Thank you. So we will have the integral x goes from 0 to 1. We have x cubed, and then we get y squared over 2 evaluated at 0 and 2 pi, plus e cubed x, and then what's the integral of dy? Y. 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 At 0 and 2 pi dx. So we get the integral x goes from 0 to 1, we get x cubed, and now we get 2 pi squared over 2, which is going to be 4 pi squared over 2, which is going to be 2 pi plus e cubed x times 2 pi. Okay. So I've just evaluated the y integration. And now it's just x integration. All right, so now I have, I'll pull things out again, 2 pi integral x goes from 0 to 1 of x cubed dx plus e cubed times 2 pi integral x goes from 0 to 1 of x dx. So we get 2 pi x to the 4th over 4 at 0 and 1 plus 2 pi e cubed x squared over 2 evaluated at 0 and 1. And so we get 2 pi over 4. Oh, I'm sorry, this should be a pi squared. 
So we get 2 pi squared over 4, so we get pi squared over 2 plus 2 pi e cubed over 1 half, so plus pi e cubed. <coughs> plus zero. How much cap 3 was there? Not much. The only place that really was calc 3 was setting up the iterated integral. So calc 3 set up the iterated integral. After that, it was just calc 2 twice. So again, if you're a little bit rusty, I strongly urge you to look online. I have a bunch of calc 2 problems where I've written up solutions. Make sure you're comfortable, comfortable doing you know, the calc 2 problems. OK. Any questions about this? In rectangular regions, this is essentially all that you have to do. So what's your biggest choice when I give you a problem like this to do? Whether to do x first or whether to do y first. What happens if you choose poorly? No, it's a harder problem. I'm sorry? You have a harder problem. You have a harder problem. So what should you do? Do you just bang your head down, cry, and <laughs> life is over? Try it the other way. Try it the other way, right? I really can't surprise you in stuff like this. Right? I can have you going down the wrong path for a while, but if it's not going well, put the paper to the side, take another piece of paper, try it the other way, and see if it's better. There's only two possibilities. What about in three dimensions? It's starting to get a little bit more interesting. Right? We have three choices for the first one, two for the second. There's actually six ways to do it in three dimensions, three factorial. What about four dimensions? Four factorial, 24. I'm not going to be giving you three or four dimensional things to do like this. I want to make sure you understand the concept. There's only two possibilities. If it's not working one way, try the other way. Okay. So again, this is the theory of iterated integrals. So I will state the theorem when things are nice, and then after I state the theorem, I will then go through and I will do an example where things don't work. Right. So here's the theorem. If f is continuous on a bounded nice region and switch. So I'm being a little bit vague as to what I mean by a nice region. Uh, later this week, probably on Wednesday, we'll talk about simple regions. So simple would count. Simple regions. The thing is, I don't want to give you the most general statement possible. I don't want to talk about a boundary that's oscillating infinitely off and around some little point. You know, you don't want something like that. Circles, anything polygonal works. Anything bounded by nice curves work. The main thing is the function is continuous and the region is bounded. The region is finite. It's in a certain amount of space. Okay? There are some people who are not in class today. I know they are within 12,000 miles of me. Well, maybe maybe, maybe 13,000 miles. Okay. Why do I know they're within 13,000 miles? Yes, basically half the uh, <laughs> circumference of the Earth. You know, I am pretty sure no one has left the planet over spring break. Okay? So I don't know exactly where people are, but I can bound people's existence you know, as somewhere within... Okay, any Star Trek Voyager fans? Right. They're not 70,000 light years away on the other side of the galaxy. Anybody who's in class, in the course, but not here today, I know roughly where they are. Okay? Do I know exactly where they are? No. Some people actually email me in, so I have some of them where someone is in the health center. All right. But I don't need to know exactly where they are. I just need to know roughly where they are. For this, I just need that my region is bounded. If the region is infinite, things can be very difficult. Infinities are very hard in mathematics. What are we not allowed to do? There's a couple of things you're forbidden from doing. Divide by zero. I'm sorry? Can't divide by zero. 
So we don't allow ourselves to divide by zero. What involving infinity are we not allowed to do? Cannot divide infinity by infinity. That is forbidden. What else? Multiply infinity. infinity times infinity we can do. Subtracting? We can't subtract infinity from infinity. Infinity minus infinity is not allowed. <laughs> infinity times zero is not allowed. So if I have this iterated integrals, if I end up having infinities, I can have dangerous things happen. So what I want to do is I want to give you an example of when you can't switch orders. Okay? I am not going to prove in general when you can switch orders. If people want to see a proof, I'm happy to provide references. I don't think I included references at the end of the chapter. But if people want to see when you can switch orders of integration, I will let you do that. So who being is there. If f is continuous on a nice bounded region, the two iterated integrals are equal. That is a beautiful result. You should think of this as similar in spirit to switching the order of differentiation. You can switch the order of integration. Okay. Now I haven't talked to you about how to integrate over shapes other than rectangles. You know, we will do that on Wednesday. Right now I want to give you an analog of this. Technically I'm supposed to now give you a function and show how two iterated integrals don't work. And they give you different answers. Instead of giving you a function and a double integral, I'm going to give you a double sum. I'm going to show the sum n goes from 0 to infinity, the sum n goes from 0 to infinity of a m m does not equal the sum n goes from 0 to infinity, the sum m goes from 0 to infinity of a m m for a very special choice of sequence. Okay? If I can do this for a sequence, I can smear things out and make it a function. Okay? It's just going to be a lot easier to do it like this. And I'll explain briefly, if you really want a function, how to convert this to a function. I want you to get a sense of how bad things can go. So again, hopefully you remember the financial crisis that has almost destroyed Western civilization. A lot of this was due to people using math formulas in places where they had no right to assume these formulas were valid. They did not know that the conditions were still met. They did not know that these things were independent. And not surprisingly, some of the things they thought were independent of each other were surprisingly dependent. And so a little problem here would actually cause problems elsewhere. I want you to know conditions. I want you to know why things are true. I want you to see why we need to assume the region is bounded. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just show you how you would draw things. So I'm going to draw all the points with non-negative integer coordinates. Well, okay, I won't draw all of them, that would take too long, I'll draw a bunch of them. So here's the point 0, 0, 1, 0, 2, 0, 3, 0, 4, 0, going on and on and on. This is the point uh, 0, 1, 1, 1, um, 2, 1, 3, 1, and so on. And going all the way off to infinity. And I'm going to define what my sequence is at each of these points. Okay? If you want, if you have a, a, a box, a point like this, you can imagine that these are the centers of squares. And if you don't like having a sum, what you could do is the following. Draw a small circle inside each one of these and make it basically like a cone, where the cone goes all the way up right above that point to the value I give you. And so if you make cones like this, then you can have a function. So I'm going to define my function to be plus 1 over here, minus 1 here, and then 0 everywhere else, up that column. Okay? Plus 1, minus 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. 
Over here, I'm going to be 0, plus 1, minus 1, and then all zeros. In the next one, I'm going to be 0, 0, plus 1, minus 1, all zeros. So if you look at what's going on, in one of them, I first fix a column, I sum in the column, and then I sum all the columns together. The other one, I first fix a row, sum in that row, and then sum all the rows together. Okay? So, when I look at this, row, column. So here, I'm first summing over, I fix a row, and then I sum over all the columns. What is the sum of the first row? What's the sum of the second row? The sum of the third row? All the other rows. Every other row sums to zero. So what is the left-hand side? It equals one. Over here, I fix a column, and I sum in the column. What's the sum of the first column? Second column? Third column? All the columns? All right. Probably the most marshmallow question I can ask you. Is 1 equal to 0? No. No. <laughs> no. Right? One. And yes, you can get an M&M &M for that, okay? 1 does not equal 0. Order matters. Okay? This is the simplest example I know of to illustrate what goes on. The difficulty is that the integral or the sum of the absolute value of the function is plus infinity. There's an infinity going on. And in fact, if you look at where the function is positive, you get a plus infinity from all the points where it's positive. If you look at the place where the function is negative, you get a sum that equals negative infinity. So there's actually hidden in here infinity minus infinity. Infinity minus infinity is one of the few things we are not allowed to do here. And that's why this breaks down. Okay? So this gives you a sense of why we have to be careful. Okay. Any questions on what we've done? Okay. So what's nice now is we have an extra 10 minutes. We've got time in the bank. This is wonderful. Okay? I will let the class vote. You are going to learn a very important lesson in life, and I apologize for the people who are shy and quiet. Loud people win. Okay? You've got to learn to speak up. Do you want to do more iterated integrals? Do you want to look at problems from the previous exam? What would you like to do? Exam. Exam? So, as I said, loud voice wins. No, <laughs> this is how it wins. I have seen people accepted to graduate school because of one person speaking up. So let's talk about uh, the fifth problem from the exam. The Cameron Kaler. So, it's been a while, I forget exactly who was where. Was Kim on the parabola and Kayla on the line? Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. So we have Kim is on parabola y equals x squared. Kayla is on the line y equals x minus 2. So, and I want Kim to be at the point Rs, and I want Kayla to be at the point Tu. And so the first question asks to write down a function of the location of them that will describe how far away they are. And what's the first thing you should do in a problem like this? First thing you should do when you see a problem. Draw a picture. Step one is draw a picture. Okay? It doesn't necessarily have to be the best picture. You know, Cam's on the parabola y equals x squared. 
Can those underline y equals x minus 2? Okay, when x equals 0, y is negative 2, so I start down here. Ooh, do I have to worry about whether or not this parabola hits the line? That could matter. So maybe my picture's not great. We're running low on time. Eh, I'll just draw something like this. Right? Cameron is at the point Rs. So here is Cameron. He's at Rs. Kayla's at the point Tu. I'll put her here. They've been playing together nicely lately. Okay? And I want to see how far apart they are. So that's this distance. Or I want the distance squared. So maybe the distance as a function of Rs Tu is going to be the vector Rs minus the vector Tu. And so if I use Pythagoras, this is going to be the square root of R minus T squared plus S minus U squared. And again, I'm trying to be very explicit. I'm naming my function. You know, I gave it a name, dist RSTU. Why am I not calling it D? Well, because I want to investigate the square function, so I'm saving the letter D for that. So I'll let D of RSTU to be R minus T squared plus S minus U squared. And I want to know now what's the shortest distance, what's the shortest separation between the two of them. If the parabola actually hits the line, what's the shortest distance going to be? Zero. Zero. So what do you think is true? Probably doesn't hit the line, or I wouldn't give it to you. But maybe it does. Maybe I'm you know, being I'm playing games. Okay. So for something like that, drawing the picture and just saying, well, let me just check and see, does y equals x squared satisfy this? I'd have x minus two has to equal x squared, and try to solve that and find out is there a value of x that works. Okay. Clearly, x can't be negative. X has to be at least 2, because otherwise this is going to be 0, or negative. Oh, wait a minute. If, if X is already 2, this is going to be 4, and that's going to be zero. It doesn't look like it's going to work. So I'll, I'll leave that as a calculation for you to do, but the line and the parabola don't hit each other. I'm not being that generous to you. Okay? There's some real calculus that has to be done. So the first thing is, this is a function of four variables, and I am allowing myself to vary T and U. I can vary R and S. Uh, well, if Cameron and Kayla could be anywhere in the world, I would have to allow R, S, T, and U to be completely free variables. Until kids are about two, and I know this is being recorded and my kids may watch this many years from now, they are very hard to distinguish from dogs. <laughs> no, if you have, how many of you know little kids who are two or younger? How many of you believe that there is a lot of similarities between little kids and dogs? Okay. They're hard to distinguish. Now, unfortunately, unlike dogs where you can actually put a collar on them, a leash, and attach them to a certain post, you can't quite do that with kids. So this is an idealized parental problem where I have now chained Cameron to his parabola and chained Kayla to her line. Okay? Think of this as generalized rooms, if you want. Okay? If I tell you Cameron's x-coordinate, do you know his y-coordinate? Yes. Now the tricky thing is, I told you Kim's on the parabola y equals x squared. Well, I can really view this as the parabola s equals r squared. So if I want, I can view this as s equals r squared. Similarly, if I tell you Kayla's on the line y equals x minus 2, I can view this as u equals t minus 2. And that's a much better way of viewing it is you know, not overloading the letters x and y anymore. So now, I have a new function. Can I call it d? It's going to be a function of two variables. No, it's really not a good idea to call it d. I've already used the function d. So I'll call it f. f, and now, what's it going to be a function of? So, r and t. I could have had it as a function of s and u, but it seems a lot easier. Well, look, I have the y-coordinate is the square of the x-coordinate. The y-coordinate is the x-coordinate minus 2. I'm telling you everything in terms of the x-coordinates. 
So let's have those as the main variables. So f of r t is going to be r minus t squared, that doesn't change. Ah, but now s is just going to be r squared, and u is just going to be t minus 2. You've got to make sure you put in the parentheses so the negative sign distributes. And this is the function we now want to study. And it's a function of two variables. Do I need to use Lagrange multiplies to attack this? I don't. I have incorporated the constraints directly into the problem. Could I have used Lagrange multipliers? Yes, I would have had a function of four variables to maximize, and I would have had two constraints. This would have been Lagrange multipliers with multiple constraints. Is Lagrange multipliers with multiple constraints, was that fair game for the last exam? Nope. No. You could have used it if you'd wanted to, but it would have been a lot more work. It's much simpler in this case. Oh, look, s equals r squared. That's an easy change to put in. u equals t minus 2. That's an easy change to put in. This is a much nicer function to look at. And let's just study this function directly. So how do I figure out what's going on with this function? How do I figure out the maximum or minimum candidates? Yes? Set the derivative equal to 0. So there's a few things you can do that will really upset me. You know, equivalent to rooting for the Yankees is to write f prime here. Okay, f prime will really make me upset. What does f prime mean? We don't know what f prime means. When you have one variable, the prime means take the derivative with respect to that variable. With several, it's unclear. You can write df at r t, or you can write grad f at r t, or you can write upside down triangle, and I don't know why I always say upside down. At RT. <laughs> and that's going to be DF partial F partial R partial F partial T. And we can calculate the first derivative. It's going to be a vector. So a lot of people, when they were calculating gradients on the problems, they added the coordinates. That gives you a number. Okay? The derivative is giving you a vector of change. And so now I would calculate dfdr, dfdt, and I would try to see where things are zero. The problem is, this is a, well, this is being recorded, and my kids might listen. This is a pain. Okay? This is going to be a polynomial over here. Okay, I'm going to get an r squared minus 2rt plus t squared. All right, that's not so bad. I'm only going to have quadratic terms here. When I take the derivatives, I'm only going to have terms to the first or second power in r and t. That's not so bad. Over here, which is giving me a heartache? So I have r squared minus t minus 2 squared. When I expand out the square, I'm going to get an r to the fourth. When I take the derivative, I'm going to get r cubed. How many of you have memorized the quadratic formula? The hand should be up. This is almost equivalent right now to are you awake? Okay. If you are not awake now, just have you know. Hopefully, one of your friends will just raise your hand for you and remind you that tonight you need to learn the quadratic formula. Okay. If I give you a quadratic form, a problem, ask you to solve three x squared plus seventeen uh, x plus eight equals zero. Should you be able to find the roots? Yes. Should you be able to have fun while doing this? Probably not. But you can do it. There is a formula for the cubic. It's painful. There is a formula for the quartic. It's even more painful. There is no formula for the quintic and higher. It's a theorem that there is no way to write down the solution involving just radicals and plus minus times divide if it's a polynomial of degree 5 or higher. You could memorize the cubic. Oh. Mm -hmm. Or you could use the method of divine inspiration. Mm -hmm. And so it turns out if you just look at the formula for the, the cubic you get, you can see one of the roots. Well, once you see one of the roots, you can do long division, right? Up there with partial fractions, I think, for the things people hate the most, right? You can do long division, and then you can find the quadratic. So if I have a cubic, if I know one root, if I pull that out, I'm left with a quadratic, I can use the quadratic formula. And everything is good. So in the solution here, I think I talk about how you would find the roots by using, oh, no, I leave it as an exercise for you, wonderful. Because like, it would have cost me a whole two more pages to do that. So if you have trouble, I'm happy to send it to you. 
But how many of you remember the rational root test? Do they still teach this in high school, the rational root test? So if I give you a polynomial with integer coefficients, the way you can try to find the possible candidates. So you get 2r cubed minus 3r squared plus 5r minus 2 equals 0. If you have a rational root p over q, the possibilities are plus and minus the number over here divided by plus and minus the number here or vice versa. And so you can actually figure out what the possible candidates are. There's not that many things to check. So it's, you know, plus or minus 1, plus or minus 2, plus or minus... Oh, good, the ratio... Oh, good. I was even very nice, so it doesn't even matter if you mix up which way things go, because they're both 2. Or plus or minus 1. So there's only 8 things to check, and I think it's either 1 half or negative 1 half that works. So it's not so bad. All right, so this is a good place to stop because it's, of course, time to stop.